Thank you guys. Good singing and everything. I love the songs. You know, I like the Christmas songs in the song, but I like all the, so many of the songs, but I like the Christmas songs and it's one of those things that we only sing Christmas songs like once a year. But thankfully these songs about the resurrection, we pretty much sing all year round because uh, every Sunday, aren't we celebrating the resurrection of Christ? I mean, that's why we're meeting together on the first day of the week. So it comes that time where we're going to talk about that. And then since we're doing the uh, Lord's Supper after this service, I'll keep the, this message fairly brief. And then we'll uh, have the, the, the Lord's Supper. I want to talk about the Last Supper, okay? But typically when we say the Last Supper, what we're thinking about is the picture that we've got from da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper where they're all... Uh, these like women looking, <laughs> I mean, you see John, have you ever seen that picture? John looks like, I had to like really study, zoom in, like, hey, did he paint a woman right there? Anyway, that's a, another subject, <laughs> but that's the last supper. That, that's the only, that's why it's called the last supper, I think from that painting, but it's really not in the Bible called the last supper. It is called the Lord's supper, but I want to preach this uh, short, just point out a few things here from this chapter and uh, just something I, I was thinking about. Uh, in this chapter alone, there's a couple other suppers that are mentioned that he, that he has. And so I wanted to point a couple things out. First, let's mention the, what was known uh, commonly as the Last Supper, Matthew 26. Let's go there. Matthew 26. This is the, we'll call this the first Last Supper. It's probably the Last Supper before his crucifixion. I think we could probably agree on that. Matthew 26, let's look at verse 17. Matthew 26, verse 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into a city uh, to such a man, and say unto him, The Master saith, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The son, of man go, uh, the son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been better for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And I can't help but think that as they were sitting down there, taking bread probably every time they ate bread with jesus they probably thought about the feeding of the five thousands another thing that you think about where he he did this miracle in uh, dividing the loaves and then god multiplies it and and uh, and he prays it and blesses for blesses it but this was before his crucifixion and this is the last supper so to speak the lord's supper that we commemorate as a church um at least you know as our practices at least once a year uh, this year we'll definitely do it another time. But look over at 1 Corinthians now 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is where Paul is actually explaining how we uh, commemorate this event. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup 
when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. <clears throat> and so you see this idea of taking it until the Lord comes. Until that day. And he said in Matthew, he said, uh, you know, I won't drink of this again with you, of this, of this fruit of this vine, until I drink it with you in the kingdom of heaven. So, uh, so this is something that's supposed to be done until the Lord returns. And so uh, we see that in 1 Corinthians 11. And then uh, the second supper that we see, the second last supper, let's go back to Luke chapter 24. All right, Luke 24, let's begin reading this again. There's a lot of details in this story. If you haven't noticed this or if you've ever tried to uh, put all the uh, stories, all the gospel accounts and put them in a chronological order, man, it's tough. I mean, <laughs> if you want uh, practice in like just, just frustration, pulling out your hair, try to make sense of all those, right? It's, it's really difficult. That's why I encourage you to just read it in you know, whatever gospel account you're reading, just read that and get what God has for you of it and don't stress out about things not fitting up. John always throws, throws some things in there that, uh, that, that trips you up a little bit, but, uh, there, but it's, God's got it all in there for a reason. Okay? But in this context, here's what we see is two gentlemen on the, way, on the road to Emmaus. We don't know who they are exactly. One of them is a Cleopas. Uh, apparently, and, and we don't know the whole story here, but let's start reading in verse 28 again. Verse 28, so they're walking down uh, this road, and uh, you know the story. He says, uh, I'm sorry, before we start reading. Walking down the road, and they say, uh, uh, <laughs> this man is with them. And it's like, what's going on? And so he tells them, hey, have, you must be a stranger. Don't you know? And he begins telling them about Jesus. You, you're, you understand that. He begins telling them about Jesus and all these things that happen. And he, and he was a prophet, mighty indeed. This is what these men said. And word before God and all the people. And, uh, and, and then this guy says, Oh, fool, verse 25, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus at this point, but he's explaining to them from the, from the Word of God, from the Old Testament, all the things that Moses and all the prophets had said about the coming. Uh, uh, so I think we figured out that it was, uh, oh, I can't remember how, how long the road was exactly, but, uh, uh, but this is a, quite a bit of a road that, he, that he's taken. I think like seven miles is what we figured out maybe uh, an esti would be a decent estimate. And then uh, they, they're walking down this road and they're getting this, uh, this lesson from, from Jesus himself about himself. And then when they come to this point, let's start now in verse uh, 28. And they come to this point, they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. So... Uh, they're just being hospitable, saying, hey, well, let's just go ahead and eat. And here's what happens. It came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Now, again, I don't know who these guys are, and I don't know what this would have triggered in their mind, what people knew at that time about the, the Lord's Supper and the breaking of the bread and all that stuff. But it seems like this was an event that would show who he was, because the next verse says this, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And I take that literally. I'm thinking that they're just standing there. He breaks bread, and they're all of a sudden they're like, ah, oh, this is Jesus, and then he's just gone. He vanishes, right? It's a, it's a, it's an interesting story. But as you read that, that's what you see. And then uh, uh, it seems to me like uh, Jesus didn't even eat with them. Perhaps I mean, he just breaks the bread. They recognize who he is, and then he's gone. And I'm going to try to explain that here in the next point. So, okay, so then as you read further, we see what I'm going to call the third Last Supper. Luke 24, verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I should have uh, said that 
Uh, now he's gone forward. Uh, they went in, in the, let me see here, let's, verse 33. They rose up at the same hour, returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told uh, what things were done in the way, and how he had known them in breaking of bread. Okay, so that signifies that when he broke bread, that, that helped them somehow recognize that it was him. Verse 36, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of him. Now he's in the midst of all the disciples there. And said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted. And suppose that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, uh, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a, honey, of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of, of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. So here he is showing up once again, and food's involved. It's like, it's like we know Jesus was a Baptist, because every time they met together with disciples, food was... <laughs> all right, that's a bad joke, sorry. But anyway, here once again, he sits down, he has food with them. Now this time, I think... Uh, just a, kind of a little bit of a speculation here, but I think this specific occasion was to show them that he was, phys he was physically resurrected, not just spiritually, but physically Amen. resurrected. Now, it's really interesting when you study this, because if you read in another uh, account, I, can't, I, I think maybe Matthew, uh, he is seen by Mary Magdalene, and he says, touch me not, don't handle me. I've not yet ascended up to the Father. But here in the presence of the disciples, he's saying, handle me. Touch me, right? And he had said before about uh, uh, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, let me see here. Look at verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is, not, uh, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not, what does he say, flesh and bones. I find that interesting that he doesn't mention flesh and blood like elsewhere, but flesh and bones. And so I think, this is just a little bit of speculation, uh, but I think it's worth mentioning. I think that at that point he had ascended up to the Father, and now he's showing them his glorified body. Now, why would that be important? Well, I think that this helps us to understand the significance of a bodily resurrection. And there's false teachers out there that believe Jesus didn't, or didn't resurrect bodily, and they'll also try to imply that we're not going to resurrect bodily. There are people that believe that. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Anyway, it's a thought. You give you something to study on your own. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the, a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, everything in the grave is corruptible, right? Well, you can witness that pretty quickly. It doesn't take long for, for bones and body to decompose and, and all that. But he's talking about something that is incorruptible. And he says, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. So I have a, we have a promise, right? And we have something that we could look forward to, a blessed hope that one day we'll be resurrected in a glorified body. We won't be, it'll be a body, probably look just like this body. I don't know. Maybe made out of the same atoms. I don't know, but they're going to be made perfect. It's going to be incorruptible body. And I think uh, that's kind of the same idea that happened to Jesus. But so there are several different suppers that are mentioned right here. But that leads me into the final uh, supper. John indicates that there might be another one. Uh, but I'll leave that for you to study out for yourself. But, uh, but here is the one that interests me. Back when I read Matthew 26, 29, he said, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, I don't know if the disciples there have a specific feast that they're going to take part in with Jesus right in the kingdom. But here's what I know. Go to Revelation 19. This is the supper I'm looking forward to. Revelation 19, verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. One day, I believe, we're all going to stand before God. I, I, here's what I think that's going to happen. At the same time, the resurrection is going to happen right before uh, the wrath of God's poured out on the earth and all the wickedness that's here. And so while we're up in heaven feasting with the Lamb right, and having this marriage supper of the Lamb, the, the seven seals are being poured out on this, on this earth and judgment, uh, judgment upon that. But we will be partaking in this supper. We will be also during that time, there'll be the judgment, okay? Uh, the judgment seat of Christ where we will actually receive rewards for the things that we've done here in this body. So these are things to look forward to. Things that uh, uh, we recognize, you know, all these times that he fellowshiped with, uh, with his disciples. You know, I think about John laying on his chest. And I think of like just the closeness they had in this, in this camaraderie. You know, this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important for uh, church to take communion in a in just among their own local body, all right, and and, and I was trying to explain it to like this this morning in Iola, it's like a uh, it's a family. Okay, do we believe we're the family of God? Yes. Do we believe that everybody out there who is saved is part of the family of God? Yes, I believe that. When someone gets saved, they're added to the Lord. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ, right? I believe I can go all over this world and find people who are saved, and I'll be like, man, that guy, we're like-minded. You know, I can tell that person is saved, has Jesus in their heart, and, and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. But here's, here's how I help to understand this. So if that's the case, people say, well, there must be a universal church, right? We're all the church. We're part of the church age, <laughs> some people have said. And the, and the church, right, is it's all those who are saved. They're added to the church. Yeah, well, when they were added to the church in the book of Acts, they were added to this big assembly, 3,000 people. I mean, they were added to this church. It wasn't until uh, chapter 7 where Stephen's persecuted, I mean, St Stephen's killed and the church is persecuted, that they begin scattering abroad. And after they scatter abroad, then they start developing all these independent bodies of, you know, these different churches. You see over and over in the Bible, it's talking about churches, the church of Thessalonica, the church of Corinth, the church of Galatia, right? And all these, and the seven churches of Asia. Now there's all these independent churches. Now, are they all brothers and sisters in Christ? Yes, they are. But here's what I was thinking that kind of helped me understand this. So I have a sister. I just have one sister. And she lives in, uh, she lives in, in the area, actually. And, and uh, if I go to her house, 
She's still my sister, but from the day I got married and had kids and, uh, and, and began to run my own house, right, we operate by a certain set of rules. There's certain, uh, a certain lifestyle that we have that she doesn't necessarily share. There's some rules that we live by that she doesn't necessarily live by. And if I went to her house, you know, I'm going to go by her rules. You know, she might say, hey, you got to take your shoes off. And I could say, well, I don't do that at home. doesn't matter. I'm in her house, right? But wait a minute, but we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're in a different house. We're a different, different family. Does that make sense? So the, local, the idea of a local church is that you're an independent family. Still got brothers and sisters in Christ all over this world. But this is why God uh, has put in the Bible to ordain pastors uh, over the assembly, right? To lead and to guide and to enforce certain, uh, uh, certain rules and, and ordinances and stuff, according to the Bible, of course. And, uh, and of course, we all have a voice on that. I like the idea of, uh, I don't have a problem with voting. You know, some people would say the church should never have votes or anything like that. I don't agree with that. I think we're a family. We should do things together. But how does somebody do it in their household? Well, the Bible says the qualification of a pastor is to have a, a wife, right, and children who are in sub subjection to him. And then what's it say? For if a man know how, not how to rule his house, how can he take care of the church of God, okay? So what they're showing is that each church is going to be run separately. It's going to be differently. There's going to be slight differences. You know, doctrinally we might be the same, but it's a family. So this is why when we take the Lord's Supper, up until the day that we're all sitting together in one huge body, and then we can be all called the, the church universal <laughs> up in heaven, okay? But until that day when we're sitting together, every church is slightly, it might be slightly different, and that's okay. We allow liberty for some differences in policies and stuff like that. Okay, but, uh, but while, uh, while we're waiting for the Lord to come, while we're waiting for that marriage supper of the Lamb, He set in order this practice that we would have where we would take the Lord's Supper and we would remember uh, that time that He ate supper with His disciples. And he said, I won't again have the, the fruit of the vine until I eat of it, uh, drink of it fresh in the uh, kingdom of God. So in, in, in honoring that and thinking about that, and I preached about this last Thursday, but uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper being Easter. Uh, it's, it seems like an appropriate time of the year to do that. And so I'm going to dismiss in prayer and then come back in a few minutes. Uh, when we come back, we'll sing, uh, we'll sing one song. Then I'll administer the Lord's Supper, and then we'll sing one more hymn. And when we sing that hymn, we're just going to dismiss quietly. So, uh, you know, get any fellowship and done right now. As I said, I know some are going to come back and go soul winning, so that might be awkward. But let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, guiding us, directing us, giving your word. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you've called those who follow you, your friends and your family, Lord, I know that Christ is the head of every true church, and He's the head of this church. But Lord, I pray that You'll help us as individual family and body of Christ to walk together in unity and to, uh, to do our best to be in one accord and to understand uh, things together, reason things out together, and even to judge one another, as the Bible uh, says we ought to do uh, according to Scripture. I pray, Lord, You'll guide us. Keep us safe, Lord. Thank you for the, effort, for the soul winning efforts that uh, have, been, have gone forth and, and the results, Lord. We want to magnify you, lift up your name, bring honor to you, and glorify you by producing much fruit. So help us to do that. And help us now, Lord, as we uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to receive uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.